Hello and welcome to Trauma Registry Tips, Coding Brain Injuries with Registry Partners. My name is Jennifer Roy and today we will discuss some common traumatic brain injuries and how to code them. Before we get into any coding talk, I would like to go over a thought process that can be used for coding any injury from a traumatic patient. There are five steps with the first starting, what region of the body is the injury in? Is it in the head, the neck, face, thorax, abdomen, spine, or extremity? You should next then consider which system is injured. Could it be in the skeletal, muscular, nervous, respiratory, or cardiovascular? Next, you want to think of what type of injury. <clears throat> is it a fracture, a rupture, hematoma, dislocation, crush, sprain, laceration, or abrasion? Is it acute or chronic? Is this something new or was this existing on the patient prior to arrival? And finally, how severe is the injury? Can go anywhere from minor and moderate through to serious, severe, or a critical or maximal severity. Now let's go over some basic brain anatomy. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain and is divided into two halves known as the left and right hemisphere. Each hemisphere of the cerebrum is divided into four sections called lobes. These lobes are the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. The frontal lobe is responsible for social and cognitive behaviors as well as body movement. The parietal lobes are responsible for complex behaviors, including all behaviors involving the senses. The temporal lobe is known as the speech center of the brain and is also responsible for memory development and learning. The occipital lobe is mainly responsible for vision. Next, we have the cerebellum, which is located at the back of the brain beneath the occipital lobes. Just like the cerebrum, the cerebellum is divided into two halves, called hemispheres. The main job of the cerebellum is to control and coordinate movement, posture, and balance. The brain stem is located at the very base of the brain and assists in many of the body's most important functions, such as breathing, heart rate, swallowing, controlling blood pressure, temperature, and the ability to sleep. The brain tissue is surrounded by the skull and a tough membrane called the dura. Within and surrounding the brain tissue and dura are many arteries, veins, and the cranial nerves. Therefore, trauma to the head may damage the skull, the blood vessels, the nerves, the brain tissue itself, or all of the above. Some common traumatic brain injuries we encounter when entering patients into the trauma registry include subdural hematoma, epidural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cerebral contusion, diffuse axonal injury, or DAI, and secondary injuries of swelling and edema. The following slides will go over these injuries, provide some coding tips, and review some case studies. Before we get more into the various brain injuries, let's talk about some general information that is helpful in coding for all types of brain injuries. First, think about if any loss of consciousness occurred or if the patient expired. Next, consider if this injury is new, acute, or if it is chronic. Where is it located? In the cerebellum? or the cerebrum. How small or large is it? This can be determined through measurements from imaging studies or operative reports or described, such as tiny, small, or large. Is it unilateral or bilateral? Is there more than one on one or both sides? And finally, how old is the patient? The age of the patient can have an effect on coding rules, so be sure to reference your coding guidelines and rules when dealing with pediatric patients. This information can be found in various locations throughout the patient's EMR or chart. Knowing what you are looking for can help guide you on where to look. For example, the size and location of the injury can typically be found in a radiology report or an operative note, whereas the patient's loss of consciousness status and age can be found in a nursing note or an HMP. It is also noticeable to be aware if the patient has a bleeding disorder or takes blood thinners. Close monitoring may need to occur as injuries may develop or grow after arrival, so be sure to review records and notes carefully in this patient population. 
And there's just one more thing that needs to be considered from brain injuries, and that is timing. When looking at time to code an injury, coding a brain injury should be done at 24 hours or at an initial confirmed diagnosis, if later than 24 hours. This should be kept in mind and remember to review follow-up imaging and notes around this 24-hour mark. Now let's take a look at some of those traumatic injuries and some related case studies. Remember to keep these points in your mind and feel free to reference as needed. The first injury we will cover is subdural hematomas, which is a collection of blood between the dura and the arachnoid and usually results from a sudden blow to the head that tears blood vessels that run along the brain. People with bleeding disorders and those who take blood thinners are more likely to develop a subdural hematoma. Now let's begin with our first case study. A 78-year-old female on platics arrives to the ED after having a ground-level fall. Patient hit her head on concrete, a scalp hematoma was noted, and she was positive for a headache. A CT scan reveals a 1.4 centimeter left frontal subdural hematoma. What information would be the most helpful in coding this injury? A, the size of the subdural hematoma, 1.4 centimeters. B, she has a scalp hematoma. C, the location, left frontal. Or D, she has a headache. Now feel free to pause this presentation and review previous slides to find the answer. Once satisfied, please resume at your convenience. The answer is A. While the rest of the answers are helpful in further defining the subdural hematoma, without the size, an accurate code cannot be applied and therefore a clear, clear picture of the injury cannot be identified. Our next injury is an epidural hematoma. An epidural hematoma is bleeding that occurs between the inside of the skull and the outer covering of the brain called the dura. Epidural hematomas typically occur when a skull fracture tears an underlying blood vessel. This injury is most often the result of a severe head trauma caused by motorcycle, bicycle, skateboard, snowboarding, or automobile accidents. An epidural hematoma may also be referred to in a record as an extradural hematoma. Now let's look at a case study for an epidural hematoma. The 28-year-old male arrives at the ED after losing control of his bicycle. The patient was not wearing a helmet and hit his head on the road. The CT scan shows a 1-centimeter epidural hematoma and fracture of the right temporal bone. Where would be the best place to find the size information in the patient's chart to code the injury? A. The ED physician note. B. The radiology report. C, the HMP, or D, all of the above. Again, feel free to pause the presentation or review previous slides to find the answer. Once satisfied, please resume at your convenience. The answer is B, the radiology report. As a radiologist is the provider most trained to review images, this is the most reliable source to get your coding information from. The other reports will most oftentimes hold this information but on occasion there can be discrepancies, either from additional interpretations, must confirm if this is correct or a mistake in transcribing, or if a procedure or operation was performed that provided a better view of the injury than radiology and the size must be updated. These types of discrepancies must be identified and then confirmed which is correct before obtaining the correct code. Once again, be sure to reference coding rules and guidelines to help direct you to proper coding. A subarachnoid hemorrhage is bleeding in the subarachnoid space that exists between the arachnoid membrane and the pia mater that surrounds the brain. Subarachnoid hemorrhages can result from falls, motor vehicle accidents, or other sudden blows to the head. Now let's review a case study for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. An 18-year-old male arrives to the ED after a fall on his skateboard. The patient was not wearing a helmet. Loss of consciousness was reported. The CT scan shows a small frontal subarachnoid hemorrhage. What information is missing to most accurately code this injury? A. The size of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. B. Length of loss of consciousness. 
or see where it is located. Feel free to pause the presentation and review previous slides to find the answer. Once satisfied, please resume at your convenience. The answer is B. If you recall from earlier, <clears throat> not knowing the length of loss of consciousness can have an effect on coding. The size is provided, which is small, and we know that the injury occurred in the frontal lobe of the cerebrum. The next traumatic brain injury is a cerebral contusion, which is scattered areas of bleeding on the surface of the brain. This typically occurs in the frontal and temporal lobes after the brain strikes on the ridge of the skull or a fold in the dura mater. Cerebral contusions are most of the time a closed head injury caused by motor vehicle accidents, falls, assaults, and sports and recreational activities. Earlier, we discussed coding tips for all brain injuries. For cerebral contusions, you must also consider how many contusions and if there is a midline shift. A midline shift is a shift or displacement of brain tissue across the center line of the brain as seen in this image. Fortunately, most patients can recover from a midline shift after some time. A diffuse axonal injury is caused when the brain's long connecting nerve fibers, axons, are torn. This happens when the brain shifts and rotates inside the skull. DAIs have three grades. Grade one is considered mild, with microscopic white modern changes in the cerebral cortex, corpus callosum, and brainstem. Grade two is moderate and has gross focal lesions in the corpus callosum. And finally, a grade three is severe and has the same finding as moderate with additional focal lesions in the brain stem. It is also good to be aware that CT scans are not good at detecting a DAI, and MRI scans are used to diagnose them. A DAI cannot be diagnosed on the basis of clinical observations only. Imaging is required. Once again, be sure to consult your coding guidelines and rules when identifying a DAI. When coding a DAI, the following should be considered. Was there a coma involved? Keeping in mind that a coma is defined as the absence of eye opening to painful stimuli, no following of commands, and no spoken words or utterances. Did a loss of consciousness occur, and if so, how long? Associated with the loss of consciousness, were there any brainstem signs? Where was it confined to, white matter or basal ganglia? Did it involve the corpus callosum? Be aware of coding rules if white matter, basal ganglia, and the corpus callosum are involved. Also, patients with a confirmed DAI may have multiple degrees of other head injuries that may affect coding. Be sure to check your rules. Now let's cover secondary injuries that may form. The first is swelling, which is a generic description for a swollen brain. Swelling can lead to the loss of sulci, collapse of ventricles and cisterns, midline shift, and herniation. Edema, on the other hand, is a specific type of swelling due to increased water content. Increased water may be either inside or between cells. Brain edema can be distinguished because of the presence of hypodensity on a CT scan. These are both codable injuries, but must be related to a head injury. Be sure to review the chart carefully. And finally, when a patient is diagnosed with a generic closed head injury, be sure you carefully review the chart for mention of a headache or concussion, which can change your coding. Now, once again, be sure to refer to your coding guidelines and rules for directions. Now we're going to change directions just a little to procedures. When a patient has a brain injury, procedures can range from diagnostic and stabilization to treatment and can be very invasive depending on the severity of the injury. Here are a few examples of some procedures ranging from your basic diagnostic imaging of CTs and MRIs used to diagnose and monitor brain injuries <clears throat> to moderate treatment of pressure monitoring and draining up to a piece of skull removed to facilitate the removal of blood clots or provide room to allow swelling to subside without causing major, major damage to the brain. These are just a few examples. Many more procedures may be done depending on the nature of the injury. On behalf of the Trauma Service Line Leadership Team, we would like to thank you for taking the time to review some tips on how to code brain injuries. If you have any further questions or would like information about registry partners, feel free to reach us at the link provided. Have a wonderful day.